would like to invite Professor Uriel Reichmann. I think that definitely a round of applause is befitting This is your chair. As an opening question, and you can take it further, if you will, please. Professor Reichmann, you are a dreamer. You are a person who identifies processes long before anyone else does. The fact is that we're here and you open the school and so many things that you see and others don't. And I'd like to ask you in 2023, where is this going toward? How do you see the market, the world, all the sectors and everything that we talked about and how can you converge them for the next four years? What should be done today in order to actually realize this vision? So this is a very narrow question. Yeah, indeed. You always go back to the very fundamental questions. This whole educational approach or concept that we developed here is based on one simple ingredient, and that's being truly human and individual. The idea of how do you bring a group of people to believe themselves first and foremost, to trust their willpower, to trust their friends, and to take themselves and push themselves forward. It sounds elementary, but that's the key secret in any educational matter. The educational matter is first and foremost such that you have to instill in the individual this internal strength and the wish to advance and learn more. Now, this is not just something that drops on you from nowhere. You have to assign personal tasks for individuals. The entire educational concept has to rely more and more on personal performance. You know, provide them with challenges, provide them with topics to write about, assignments. Don't make them, you know, people who simply attend and listen in a passive way in some classroom and then take a test that hardly anyone would read, and that would be the end of it. So if they only train for tests, they would forget about what they read. And if they only sit there and listen, in the best case scenario, you know, today everyone's using computers. But um, you can just uh, find the statistics. Who's trying to actually type what they hear or play computer games? The idea is to create a system of dialogue one that would challenge the individual and lead them to push themselves forward and learn. So that's the key secret. Now, when it comes to the educational system, and that has to be the foundation. The foundation has to be, uh, I mean, the university exists first and foremost in order to deal with the human capital of a society. That's the greatest strength of any society. And you have to nurture the human capital in any university. That's the bread and butter of any university. Of course, there's research and other causes, but that's the most important thing. And when you look at the development, you must understand that the world is rapidly changing. And in a world that rapidly changes, you must mostly give people tools in order to advance to what's happening, because what you're teaching them today is going to be obsolete tomorrow when they enter the market. So you have to allow them to understand the world, know how to read the world, and allow the individual to get those elements of thinking that would allow them to rise to any challenge in the world. Hence, we live today at a time of fusion between the different academia. There's no longer there are no longer systems which are uni, uh, uh, you know, sort of monolithic or monochromatic. Everything gets 
mix. If you study law, you have to study something else. You have you study psych. Psychology, uh, you like applied research. It's everything has technologies involved, and in every subject you have multiplicity of interests. If we enter medical school, and we are going to overcome the Bolsheviks and the Higher Educational Council that tried to stop us. We are building the medical school now, and this is totally different to what we had yesterday because it is an interdisciplinary school. The physician has to understand about data in many cases. It has to understand robotics because these are things that would be a part of his work. He has to be up to date on the most, you know, state of the arts uh, research. He has to be very sort of humanistic in approach. We are dealing with the psychological aspect of how to talk to a patient, how to give, you know, sort of convey bad news. In short, this is a world of fusions. The teaching methods are those of fusion. So you don't know what will be tomorrow. You don't know where the demand will be exactly. However, you have to aspire to keep advancing. You have to open your mind. We'll give you the best tools available in the market that are available, again, that we can teach you, and you'll move forward with that. And if you basically know where you want to head, you'll be able to take the diversity of the different topics that are available. But the most important thing in education at the end of the day is being an entrepreneur and being a person who, again, doesn't agree with the status quo. He always wants to change the status quo, goes out against the conventions. He has to always check whether reality, whether the different frameworks really do, again, provide solutions for the needs. Can they be improved? That has to be the main incentive for, to everybody to be able to, to open his mind or her mind to move forward. And that is why always there is a scientific element that you have to give over. You have to teach a certain toolkit. But at the end of the day, it's a spirit of man. The spirit of man is the most important thing. Don't just be a recipient, a quiet recipient of everything that you hear. But you have to think, you have to produce, you have to step forward and beyond everything else. You have to be human. Yes, it certainly deserves a round of applause. But again, the ability to sort of sum up this uh, dream, to keep updating the status quo, to move forward without, you know, trading on the spot and keep producing constantly. Maybe these sentences um, sum, uh, sum up your vision. But let me just ask again, the, the state as a government body, does it um, interfere with this vision or is it a factor that can contribute to this vision? You know, the state always suddenly um, is always in some sort of a delay, it wakes up last minute and suddenly says to itself, oh, we need an investigative committee. Oh, how did we reach this point? How do we rectify? Maybe the state should be neutralized at the outset. You know, it keeps it keeps moving very slowly. You're not, you know, you're not at the same pace as Professor Reichmann. Maybe I should just fly on my own and the state should just be say the part. How can I put this gently? I'm not a big fan of governments because, you know, in many instances, I think the the function or what motivates or pushes forward organizations is that personal credit, it's a political power, and of course there are some other factors as well. But all in all, I think the greatest power um, when one you know wants to control it's not just to do but it's to enable people that have plans to give them that financial support so that they'll be able to do the job. Don't try and take control, don't try control. But who builds policy um, if not the state? 
to. No, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm saying what kind of policy do you choose? What I'm trying to say is that there is, you see, there's a policy you want to develop. Try and find those individuals. Let them run forward. You know, check them out. Make sure that they, you know, don't fail. But personal initiative is, again, um, an engine to build the future as well. And of course, if you want to go into, into the issue of the ultra-Orthodox sector, of course, there are sectors that very much have to sort of let go, meaning to let people get to that situation where they will have that aspiration. Are you, do you, are you for support for, for sort of um, skipping over IDF service and joining the labor force already at the age of 20 or at least studying? Oh, I don't know what to say. Um, let me put it as follows. I think there has to be some sort of a change. Uh, we need change in the ultra-Orthodox sector. The, you, the change is actually happening before our eyes, by the way. It is happening. But you know what the most important thing is? Just let him go. Let the ultra-Orthodox release him. You know, let me just be open with you. Yeah, it's about time. <laughs> I'm not a religious person, but the Shulchan Aruch, which is an halachic book, was always of interest to me. I said, bring from the library, I want to read this, the book of Shulchan Aruch, because some people actually live their lives in accordance with this book. And I opened it up, and it was, wow, like this robotic sort of um, um, essay. This is how you're allowed, what is what you're allowed to do. This is how you're supposed to conduct yourself. But we're not talking about that. Uh, but we probably wouldn't be here historically if we didn't have some sort of a guiding line over 2,000 years of exile. Let me get to that. What I'm trying to say about the ultra-Orthodox sector and about all of us uh, for that matter, I see the establishment of the State of Israel as a third chapter to the history of the Jewish people. There was the national life again, for a th about 1,400 years ago, right in the land of Israel, times of the Mishnah, then there's about 1,800 years of exile. And then, now we have that resurrection again. So what I'm saying is that every period in time, and these are again huge chapters of history, a lot of changes took place, but there are every different period has different challenges. No, that's fine. That's why I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is that in terms of the ultra-Orthodox sector, we are waiting for those great Torah leaders, for their great teachers to try and adjust the tradition that they brought from the exile. And there were different needs at the time. Yes, they protected the Jewish people throughout the exile period. But now it's a different. So we're saying with the establishment of the step, we actually no longer have the need to preserve certain traditions. Yes, we have been released from all sorts of needs or, or traditions that kept us protected, that we couldn't emerge because people didn't want us where we lived. And now what I'm trying to say is you have to just sort of release. You have to let go. You have to sort of let, release those amazing strength that, that are there within the ultra-Orthodox society. There's so much potential, human potential, that can also help overall society. They have to take off and fly upwards. And I'm all for doing everything that we can to make this happen. I'm all for that they won't be compelled those who, you know to you know to be to learn with the, uh, with women if they don't want to that's fine uh, by the way, that lies counter to the um, High Court of Justice that actually did a, I have a lot of criticism about the Supreme Court, but I'm against that, uh, the constitutional or the, the judicial overhaul that's trying to do away with democracy. But let, let us let it go for a moment. Just a final sentence, if I may. If I may. We said that this, again, every religious person, man or woman, you know, the great leaders have to come and say, we have tradition, we want to protect tradition, we want to preserve tradition, we have value, but this doesn't prevent many. I'm saying it's not supposed to prevent. I mean, tradition is not supposed to prevent young people from going out and integrating and learning. In, you know, a, a person who wanted to take a certain course 
divorce or wanted to be an entrepreneur had to go and ask his rabbi. No, let, let them go, release them, release the hold over them. I think the element of, of that individual strive, of um, realizing your own individual potential, we have to let that happen. Okay, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to continue this action, Professor Reichman, without recognizing or also looking through the prism of the other side, putting on their spectacles or going into the field and trying to understand the difficulties, the challenges that present themselves. And then maybe when both parties understand what is my, the other party's position, then maybe we can talk about this. But, you know, I want to ask something of you. I'd be so happy to sit with the ultra-Orthodox leadership, be so happy to sit with them and talk. It's always great to listen to the other side and learn from the other side, but we, again, you know, we live in a time when if we say that we want to talk with the other side, it's perceived as some sort of succumbing or some sort of a defeat. No, I actually mentioned this. I mentioned a national trauma that exists till this very day, and that is that in 1928, um, BCE, there was a division between the empire of Israel and Judah. And that's when the kingdom divided up, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah that actually existed uh, another thousand years and so forth. But it became a trauma, a national trauma at that point in time. That is why I want to say to you what we should not allow. We must never let go of the attempt to hug and embrace one another. We must never give up on other parts of the populations, and we need this dialogue. Uh, otherwise, we'll find ourselves before a, a national catastrophe. Absolutely, I totally agree. You know, Barack, the discussion maybe took us in different directions, step after step. I I wouldn't want the CEO of Google, you know, to sum up the political part that we have somehow touched upon. Because, you know, your vision is about figures and the industry and growth and giving tools and so forth. And yet, Professor Rahman sort of mentioned a vision. Do you think that that is the right vision to emerge from the current crisis, meaning this formula, will it help us exit or, you know, emerge from the crisis? I very much relate to human resources, nurturing human resources, and I've it's my if you notice when Professor Reichmann, when he said, you know, let release your hold on them, let them fly, let them fly high. Because we, as again, business leaders, is to let people go, meaning to release them, not to bind them, let them advance. And you talk about before that in the ultra orthodox, right? And sorry for turning to you. Um, absolutely, I represent. But you know, I actually deal a lot with integrating the ultra orthodox into my office officers and also a secular uh, person if doesn't want to participate in specific you know social evenings I won't compel anybody I feel terrible to have a situation where let's say again a man and woman they'll never have to be alone but I say to myself there is some sort of a barrier here that you have to understand for example demand for kosher internet at Google that is a bit of a problem because I'm actually producing global products, right? So there has to be openness on both sides. I don't think there is such a demand, by the way. At the workplace, really? Kosher internet, really? I mean, in my home, I can have that. No, but you know what? I would like to empower more population. I would like to create more sectors and um, and more um, circles that will also take in uh, ultra orthodox girls from the seminaries. But I very much connect to what you say. I don't want to go into politics. I want to talk about you know the matters in principle. I was I worked for, in England for five years. I had Lebanese workers, ultra orthodox. Um, Syrian workers. I even had one. I have one diversity program: women and, and and male. I didn't look at any indices, not not um, you know religious uh, factors. If you're a Jew, if you're a Muslim, if you're English or not. If you had the skills, if you knew English, if you knew math, if you knew how to encode, you you know how to work. Go, come. Let's take you. Start working. Because diversity empowers me. We didn't even talk about it, but you know, studies show. I think. I think the panel has made, became more and more interesting the more 
diverse it became, right? Thank you so much, SEO of Google. Thank you so much. We have to end. Just one minute, one more sentence, if I may. Just one moment. I just want to thank the Google, our Google company, for the amazing contribution that enables them us to work together with them and to open up the gates and promote big parts of society that you mentioned before, huge populations and sectors. It's part of the mission of this institution from day one to open up its gates, to take people in, people from different areas that have to be developed and would be happy. The more, the better. Thank you so much, Professor Aurel Reichmann. Thank you so much for this wonderful conference, for this institution. Thank you so much.